Thanks for checking out this message from Faith Family Church in Shiloh, Illinois. We hope that what you hear inspires you to follow Jesus and love others. Hey, and we're so grateful to be a part of your week. Don't forget that you can give online and keep up with all of our events and so much more at myffc.info. We are uh, in a series called I'm Not Okay and That's Okay. And I uh, want to talk today on the subject of depression. My aim is not that you become more depressed, but that uh, we see some things about this situation that people face. Uh, maybe some of you are facing it right now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I did a little research on it. <clears throat> uh, the CDC published this uh, last year that in 2019, this pre-COVID, uh, close to 20% of adults in the United States suffered some kind of mild or moderate or severe depression. And those numbers are higher with teens, um, they, they say. And then that's, uh, that's pre-COVID, so that probably in this room right here at 20%, there's between maybe 40 and 50 people who in the last 12 months have dealt with some degree of depression in their lives. And uh, obviously COVID's driven those, those numbers up. Uh, just a quick, uh, you know, definition. What is depression? According to the people that study this, it's a disorder marked especially by sadness, inactivity, uh, difficulty in thinking and concentration, a significant increase or decrease in appetite and, in, and of time spent sleeping, feelings of dejection and hopelessness, and sometimes suicidal tendencies. And the, uh, the people who treat depression say that if there's five or more of these symptoms, Symptoms that last for at least two weeks that significantly affect a person's capacity to function. That is clinical depression. I like to get a broader idea of this phenomenon uh, and put it on a spectrum from disappointment. You know, we all experience, anybody here ever experience any disappointment in their life? Probably by the time you hit two years old, you've experienced disappointment. And, uh, and you know, moving from disappointment to discouragement, uh, uh, and to deep discouragement, moving into depression and, uh, and of its very mild or moderate or severe depression. Some people don't like the idea of depression. They don't never want to admit it, so they'll say that they're, they're discouraged. I mean, really discouraged. I mean, really, really, really ridiculously discouraged. But I'm not depressed. Well, okay, call it what you want. But uh, we go through these things. And three things I want to say about depression today, and the first is this, that, that God doesn't criticize us for depression. He doesn't criticize us, okay? He's okay that we're not okay. And I talked talk last week that God would rather, rather have us be honest than try to be posers with God. And if you think about it for just a second, it's ridiculous to try to pose with God because he already knows. Uh, and so uh, God, I'm not saying by that that God wants us to be depressed. Uh, what I'm saying is that he's not condemning us if we're struggling with depression, we aren't disappointing him in some way. And, uh, and so let's stop being hard on ourselves if we're experiencing that. And please, let's stop judging other people who are going through that in their lives. This sort of back of our mind thing, you know. Well, I don't know about them. You know, let's, I, what I would love to do as a church, I would love for this church to be a safe place for people who are struggling with that in their lives. So let's take the stigma off of that, yeah. Let's stop shaming people if they happen to go to a counselor or see a psychological therapist to help them to emotional wellness. Oh my goodness, they're that messed up. Let's leave that behind. You know, God's calling us to be a church that graciously accepts people's spiritual journey wherever that journey may take them through. And sometimes for some people, that journey may include depression in the lives of many people, sometimes in our own. You know, our culture sadly takes a, a dim view of depression. It kind of goes against the grain of our success-oriented worldview, a, a worldview that's so positivistic in outlook that it, that it ignores or denies negative emotions in oneself and shuns them in others. You know, few are willing to admit to it. For many, you know, they'll admit anything. They'll admit uh, pimples, warts, carbuncles, corns, 
But they'll never admit that they're depressed because that's embarrassing. It's, it is a greatly unacknowledged condition. And sadly, I find that this attitude gets into the church sometimes, you know? I mean, we say we're here for hurting people, but, you know, they should get over their pain pretty soon. Are you better yet? You know, kind of thing. And, and certainly, if, they're, if they struggle with depression, they shouldn't ever participate in serving or in any kind of leadership. You know, if they deal with depression, then they're, they're sort of suspect in some way. So I want to I uh, uh, deconstruct a false idea. Here's the false idea, that no one who struggles with depression can be an influencer or a leader. And I'm going to give some examples from the world we're in right now, some influential celebrities who have experienced depression, all right? This guy, Buzz Aldrin, he was the second guy to walk on the moon. I wonder how they made that decision. You know, he drew, drew the short straw or something. Uh, uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Well, The Rock would never get depressed. No, he suffers with, he's struggled with depression. Katy Perry, you know, very internationally known uh, singer. Uh, Michael Phelps, Olymp Olympic gold winner, uh, swimmer, you know. All these people have had the courage to be publicly open about their struggle with depression. Well, those are just famous people. Well, let's talk about political leaders who have who have experienced depression. You think, well, people who are depressed, they're just, they couldn't lead anything. Okay, well, here's one. Abraham Lincoln, what a loser, you know. <laughs> uh, he suffered from, th what they called it in his day was melancholia. That was the, that was the technical term for it. Uh, here's another loser of a political leader. His name was Winston Churchill. He didn't do much. Uh, <laughs> He talked about the dark dog that stalked him at various periods of his life. Somebody else you may know about, Mahatma Gandhi, struggled with depression. He attempted suicide as a teenager, you know. And all of these leaders experienced depression at some points in their lives, and they're not pathetic losers. They did amazing things in their time. So uh, let's go to Christian leaders, all right? So Christian leaders who, who struggle with depression, there's this guy named uh, Charles Spurgeon. Now, you've got to kind of be a history person, but Charles Spurgeon had the largest church in the world in the 1800s in London. Thousands came out to hear him preach. He was, he was one, probably, historians say he's probably one of the greatest Christian communicators in the history of the church, had deep struggles with depression and talked about it. Uh, C.S. Lewis, maybe some of you have heard of him. <clears throat> he, he grappled with it when his beloved wife passed away and, and grappled with it for a season and wrote a book called A Grief Observed. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King struggled with seasons of severe depression. In fact, he attempted suicide once or twice as a teenager. Now look, all of these spiritual leaders expressed that they dealt with this issue, but they were still used by God in mighty ways, all right? So yeah, let's clap for that before we go to the next one. So I've got one more great spiritual leader to talk about. <clears throat> there we go. No, but really. So I'm going to tell you flat out, uh, I've struggled with seasons of depression in my life. You know, I've been, oh my gosh, oh, oh Rick. How can you pastor? I've been doing it for 30 years. I've been in ministry 40 years. Uh, and, you know, I've been seeing a counselor regularly for several years. Well, you've been in ministry 40 years, several years. Yeah, it took me about 32 years to stop being dumb <laughs> and go see somebody who could help me. And it's helped me immensely. Now look, I'm being open about this because I want to help those of you who have struggled or are struggling right now with depression or have loved ones who are struggling with depression. And I'm, I'm hoping that my candor about my own struggle will help you stop berating yourself, will help you not feel like you're hopeless about this, and I hope it'll help all of us to stop criticizing other people who are dealing with this. Now, if you're going to be critical of me, I've just given you more ammunition, but that's okay. Um, you know, I just want to be open about it with you. But let's talk about some leaders in the Bible 
who experienced depression. Well, nobody, no good person in the Bible got depression. Yeah, let's talk about Moses. Listen to what Moses said to God, okay? Moses, pretty great re- leader, right? He said this, I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden's too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, God, please go ahead and kill me if I found favor in your eyes. And do, I love that, you know, shoot me now if it's okay with you. And don't let me face my own ruin. I mean, leading those people wore him down to the point where he wanted his life to end. And guess what? That's a symptom of depression. You know, he had the people, where's the water? Where's the food? I'm sick of, I'm sick of manna. Why can't we go to Arby's? They have the meat. wore him down. Let's let's think about another great leader in the Old Testament. Anybody ever heard of Elijah? You know, he spent, think about this guy, he spent years uh, warning Israel to come back to God and they ignored him and they persecuted him and they tried to kill him and he had to go into hiding. Finally, Finally, the turnaround moment he'd been waiting for came. I mean, the king met, uh, and the people met Elijah on Mount Carmel and, and for the God contest, you know, and, and they got, you know, and in this corner, we have representing Yahweh, Elijah, weighing in at 185 pounds. And in this corner, uh, representing the, the, uh, Baal, we have the 400 prophets weighing in at about a ton. I don't know what they weigh. And, uh, and the God who answers by fire is the one and only only God, let's get ready to rumble. Ding, ding. Prophets of Baal screams, shout, pray, nothing happens, and then God comes out and gets a knockout in the first round. Fire from heaven. Burns up the altar, burns up everything. The people cry out, Yahweh is God, Yahweh is God. They get rid of the bad prophets and they all sit down for a feast in honor of the one true God and then it starts to rain. It hasn't rained in three years and the drought is broken. I mean, Elijah had to be thinking, at last, everything I've been working for and sacrificing for all these years is finally coming to fruition. Only it wasn't. There was this lady back in town. She didn't come to the meeting. She's streaming Netflix. Her name was Jezebel. And Jezebel heard about, uh, heard about what had happened, and she sent Elijah a text with a lot of angry emojis. And it said, you'll be dead by sundown. I mean, after all that, Nothing changed. Talk about disappointment. Talk about discouragement. Elijah was flat out depressed. Let's read about it. It says, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba in Judah. He left the servant there. And while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom brush, a broom, a boom box, whatever, the bush. And he sat down under it and he, and he prayed that he might die. And he said to God, take my life. I've had enough, Lord. And then he went on. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've put your your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. These are classic symptoms of depression, deep anxiety. He fled for his life. Emotional exhaustion. I've had enough. Isolation. A sense of isolation. I'm the only one left. Despair. Just take my life now. You know, according to some Christian thinkers, Moses and Elijah shouldn't have been spiritual leaders at all because they struggled with deep depression. But if that's the case, then, you know, neither should Jeremiah because he said, Lord, I curse the day I was born. And hey, Job, forget about him. Just put him in the ash can. You know, David, we talked last week about all of his psalms of disorientation. Everything's going wrong. Uh, You know, I got to add into that the Apostle Paul. (gasps) Not Paul. Well, let's look what Paul said to the Corinthians. He said, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, 
And think about this. He knew God had opened the door for him. He said, I still had no peace of mind because I didn't find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. He was waiting for news to see whether the Corinthian church even existed, still existed. He didn't know what was happening and he could get no peace of mind. He goes on later in the letter. He says, when I came into Macedonia, we, when we came into Macedonia, we had no rest. But we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us. What does that mean? He was downcast. No peace of mind. I, the, the, I'm going to just give you what I've learned from my Greek dictionaries, digging into the original. I couldn't relax. I couldn't get rest. I, I couldn't rest or get relief. My mind couldn't rest. Anybody ever experience that in your life? He said there were fears within. I, 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 Paul's the one who said, you know, don't be anxious about anything. And yet he admits later in this very letter, I face every day the, anxi the anxiety that I have for all the churches. He says I was downcast. It's, it's, it's dejected and downhearted. Listen, Paul was experiencing all these kinds of emotions and he's open about it. This is what I've been through. So I think about these, these great Bible leaders who struggled with depression, and I come up with this conclusion that depression does not signify lack of character, moral weakness, absence of faith, or spiritual failure. So if you're... If you're experiencing depression right now in this room watching or you have or you've got loved ones who do they don't have lack of character they don't have moral weakness they don't have an absence of faith they're not spiritual failures God doesn't criticize us for our depression second thing I want to say about this is that Jesus understands depression because he has experienced it too Rick what are you saying blasphemy well, put your rocks down for right now. Uh, you know, we, we think, oh, Jesus was perfect. He couldn't have. We wrestle, I think, sometimes uh, conceptually with the full humanity of Jesus. We're scared sometimes, I think, that we're going we're gonna to denigrate or, or lessen his divinity. But the mystery of Jesus coming into this world is that he is fully God and yet fully human at the same time. Jesus, as I read the Gospels, had this growing sense of foreboding about what was coming. So in Luke, he says, I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it's completed. Now, by baptism, obviously, he means the cross. But that word, how distressed I am, it means to experience great psychological pressure and anxiety. Can I put it this way? Jesus is dreading it. We see this in the, I don't know if any of you have seen the, uh, the TV series or it's online series called The Chosen. Margie and I have been watching it. And we watched a scene the other day. Yeah, it's brilliant. Watch it if you can. Uh, uh, where Jesus is walking by three crosses. It's before it's time for him to be crucified, but he sees those three guys. And the, the actor does a brilliant job of just capturing that sense of concern and foreboding in the face of Jesus. Jesus said in the book of John, he said, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, meaning the crucifixion? No, it was for this re very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Troubled. Tr I'm, I'm, he says, I'm troubled. That's a strong word in the Greek. It's a, not a weak one. It means frightened. It, 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 it depicts mental confusion, emotional turmoil, spiritual agitation. Jesus is so torn up on the inside about this that God has to speak to him with a voice from heaven. And then, of course, we come to the, the statement that gives us the deepest look into the interior life of the Lord Jesus when he says in the Garden of Gethsemane, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Wow. Jesus is experiencing distress and anxiety. He's troubled. He's got deep emotional turmoil. He says, I am overwhelmed. It means to be afflicted beyond measure. That's why I say Jesus understands what depression is like because he lived through it himself. So just because you're experiencing depression doesn't mean you're a loser. 
Jesus is right there with you. He knows what it's like. This is why the book of Hebrews says, therefore it was necessary for Jesus to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. Now get this, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Can I put it this way for those of you who struggle with depression? Since he himself has gone through depression and testing, he knows how to help us when we're going through depression. Let's take the stigma out of this. Guys, listen, depression is an affliction, not a shortcoming. Depression is a test, not a failure. So God's not criticizing us for depression. Jesus understands depression because he's experienced it too. My last point is this. The Holy Spirit empowers us during and out of depression. The Holy Spirit empowers us during and out of depression. Why do I say during and out of? Because I believe that for most of us, being healed from depression is a journey that we travel. Now look, let's be clear, uh, you will read the New Testament, the Old Testament, you see that God works through jolts and journeys. Jolts and journeys, say it with me, jolts and journeys. I like the J alliteration there, it makes me happy. Anyway, what do I mean by a jolt? I mean that kind of supernatural one and done deliverance. You know, one time of prayer lifts us permanently out of despair. And I'm not mocking that. I love it when that happens. I wish I could find the switch for that. Just, and I'd break it off in the on position and go on with life. You know, we read this kind of a jolt story from the New Testament is the story of the Gadarene demoniac. You know, the guy was, was so tormented by the devil and was out of his mind. He lived in the tombs. He didn't wear clothes. He screamed out at night and cut himself with stones. They, they tried to help him, the townspeople, and they'd bring him into town, but they had to chain him up. But he'd break the chains and just run off wild. What a torment that guy lived in. Jesus shows up in his neighborhood. The guy comes running toward him, screaming, and Jesus says to the demon, stop it, come out of him, and they start begging him, don't send us out of the country, you know, send us into those pigs. And What is your name? Our name is Legion, because we are many, and can we go into the pigs, please? Jesus says, yeah, he gives him permission. And then they go, the whole herd runs down into the lakes, drown. The, the, the workers think, man, what do we, how do we explain this to our boss? So they go back to their boss and say, boss, I don't know how to tell you this but your, your pig herd has turned into pork soup bobbing around in the, in the Sea of Galilee and nothing left of it. Well, what happened? Well, this dude named Jesus showed up and they go back and they find the man sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind. That's a jolt. You know, that story, that story uh, uh, powerfully displays God's compassion and grace and it vividly depicts Jesus' absolute power over evil forces, pointing to his identity. Think about this change, it's instant, it's dramatic. From naked to clothed, from raving to in his right mind, from running like a lunatic through the cemetery to sitting calmly at Jesus' feet. And there's no question, it is an inspiring story. It's meant to inspire us about the power that God has and, and, the, and the authority that Jesus commands. The, the demons have to ask his permission to do something, you know. But there's a downside to this if we take the wrong message from the story of this event. And the wrong message would be this, that this is the only way God works. That healing from depression should always be instantaneous, and that's how I should be healed. Now look, while some do experience this kind of deliverance, most don't, but there's still deliverance. I don't think we can go to God and say, oh, God, I want you to fix this, and here's how I want you to do it. <laughs> I don't think that's up to us to say how God's going to do something. You know, and most of us experience the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit as we journey into emotional well-being. I believe that the journey of healing involves the power of the Holy Spirit every bit as much as the jolt. The problem is some people, they just... They won't take any steps, they're just waiting for the jolt. 
just waiting for the jolt. They won't journey. Just jolt me, God. Just jolt me. Well, God says, no, I want you to take a baby step. No, just jolt me. I want a big mother may I step. Well, God says, no, you got to be like Bob Wiley. You got to take, you got to baby step in, baby step into healing. Well, I don't want that. I want to be dramatic. Who are we to tell God how he's going to do something? The Holy Spirit's just as much involved in the journey as, in the, in the, as he is in the jolt. And look, even for those of you who do get a jolt, you're still going to need to journey after the jolt. We do a Freedom Weekend here at our church. Pastor John and uh, Vicky, Miss Vicky do that, and it's incredible, and it's kind of a jolt. It's concentrated Friday night, all day Saturday, concentrating on emotional health and spiritual challenges and overcoming them, and most people uh, uh, experience some degree of change just from the weekend, but one of the things that Pastor John and Vicky say is it's not just about a one-and-done deal. It's about learning a new way of thinking, learning a new way of responding, learning a new way of trusting. As I wind this up, I just got to take a couple of sidebars, or side trips, or rabbit trails, because the story of the Gadarene demoniac brings up the subject of demons. And uh, what about depression and demons? How does, the, how does the demonic factor into depression? Well, let me say first about demons. I don't think they're just figments of imagination. There are actual spiritual beings, unseen. They're called unclean spirits. They're called demons. They're called rulers uh, of this darkness, of this dark world. They're called spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And they're there, and they work against us very subtly, very quietly, speaking in our own voice. They rarely demonstrate themselves like the gathering demoniac. Don't be waiting for that. I'll know it's the devil when the guy with the red pitchfork, the red suit and pitchfork shows up. You know, the enemy loves that kind of characterization because it makes people ignore most of what he does. He speaks in our own voice. Now look, depression, let me be very clear. Depression doesn't mean that you are demon-possessed, okay? Depression comes from something inside of us that's broken, some combination of our temperament and our upbringing and our history. But our spiritual enemy is an opportunist. He leverages whatever weakness he can find in us. He looks for vulnerabilities in our soul, in our, in our mind, emotions, in our will, and he speaks to our already troubled minds, and he amps up the fears we already experience. And we need to be aware of this phenomenon that there is an enemy out there, and the Bible says resist him. But the, 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 the Holy Spirit will, will, uh, will, will help us. So demons, I covered that. So then I want to talk about the fact the Holy Spirit will help us directly with depression, just us and him, factory direct, you know, uh, through our prayer and worship, through our reflection in scripture. That's real. That's a part of the journey. But the Holy Spirit will also indirectly help us on this journey uh, toward wellness. I mean, I, I, I refer to the fact that he uses means. He will use Freedom Weekend. Freedom Weekend is something you can do will get other, that gets other people to help you. You can read good Christian writers. Uh, one of the things the Holy Spirit may lead you to do is to go see a psychological therapist. <gasps> well, Rick, no, 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 no. If you go see a therapist, you're denying the power of God's, of God's grace. I would say, countering that, maybe God saying, this is what I've put in your life to help you. You all know the story of the man, man in the flood praying for deliverance and the two canoes came by. He said, no, no, I'm waiting for God. And then the helicopter came by and he said, no, I'm waiting for God. And then he died in the flood and went to heaven and he said, God, why weren't you there for me? And God said, I sent you two canoes and a helicopter. <laughs> maybe seeing a therapist is one of those canoes that God, that the Holy Spirit wants to use in your life. Seeing a therapist is not an admission of failure. See, if the Holy Spirit can speak through prayer and the Word, if the Holy Spirit can speak through Freedom Weekend and Christian books, then why can't the Holy Spirit speak through a trained therapist? I had a couple once come to me for marriage counseling and uh, 
their situation was pretty extreme, and uh, I, I referred them. I said, "Listen, I'm, I'm above my pay grade here. I'm not trained in this." And uh, and so the only the only psychologist that his insurance would would pay for was a secular psychologist. It wasn't a Christian. They were really nervous. So was I. So I said, well, here's the plan. You go see him and uh, talk about your issues and then come back to me and you can tell me what he said, you know. So they go see him. They come back and they, I said, well, what did he say? He said this. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And what else did he say? He said that. I said, oh, that's really good. And what else did he say? Well, he said this. By this time, I'm getting a piece of paper. I said, okay, man, I got rich as good stuff. He really helped them. So don't get into this thing of, I see a therapist, I'm a loser. I'm going to go even further out on a limb here, okay? Taking medication to help with depression is not, a mad, is not an admission of weakness and if not a lack of character or a lack of trust. Well, people should never need to take medication. Well, in a perfect world, they shouldn't need to take Tylenol either. But, well, if they're, I mean, they shouldn't take, they shouldn't take uh, antidepressants because that's a lack of faith. Oh, well, if that's true, why are you taking Tylenol? Or drinking coffee? I don't, you know. <laughs> maybe, maybe medication can help you. You know, what I'm saying is that I, I, I want you to hear me. I'm not saying that seeing a, 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 a therapist or taking medication is somehow a substitute for trusting God. We, we do these things if we do them as we seek and trust God, not instead of seeking and trusting God. I don't see it as an either or but a both and kind of situation. I don't know, Rick, somebody might say, you know, uh, uh, this message seems to be telling us that it's no problem to be depressed and you can be depressed of all you want and just learn to live with it. No, I, I don't believe that. I believe God wants us to journey toward emotional wellness. He loves us and he wants us to be well in every aspect of our lives. But I'll tell you one thing, what he's not doing is criticizing us. He's not yelling at us. God's not leaning over the banister of heaven saying, just suck it up. Jesus is not telling us to suck it up. He's saying, listen, I know what this feels like. I've experienced all your pain, including depression. And that experience for Jesus came to a, to a focal point as he hung on the cross, feeling abandoned and deserted, even by God himself. And yet, he endured that suffering for us. He endured false condemnation to free us from the condemnation of our sins. He is our merciful and faithful high priest before God. He offered a sacrifice that would take away sin so that we can be spiritually healed. And in the same move, he made that sacrifice so that we could be emotionally healed, so that he could journey with us by the Holy Spirit to wellness. And, uh, you know, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus in your life, I, I want to encourage you to start this journey with him. He wants to forgive you, he wants to change you, he wants to take hold of your hand and journey with you into spiritual and emotional wellness. Let's all bow our heads and if you're here today and you've never received Christ as your savior, I wanna give you an opportunity to, to just pray a simple prayer of faith and commitment in him. If you're watching online, I'm gonna encourage you just to repeat the prayer after me if you're able to wherever you're watching. And in this room here, let's all say it together. There are some here I believe that need to pray this prayer so let's help them and say it together uh, thank you God for sending your son Jesus to die for my sins to experience my pain so that I could be forgiven and I could be healed I, I receive Jesus as the one who forgives my sins the one who leads my life into wholeness and wellness I'll follow you, Jesus, for the rest of my days. Amen and amen. Lord, I pray for every one of us who are grappling with seasons of depression, maybe some right now, 
who are in the depths of it, Lord God. May they know your healing grace. May they be able to pull out of this, of this self-hatred uh, and, and sense of uselessness, Lord God. And may all of us as a church open our hearts and minds to be able to love people that are struggling instead of stigmatizing them. Father, I pray that Faith Family Church would be that kind of church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thanks for being a part of this week's message. If what you heard has impacted you, be sure to click subscribe and share with somebody you know who would be encouraged by it. And to take the next step here at Faith Family Church, head on over to myffc.info.